We live in a strange time. Extraordinary events keep happening that undermine the stability of our world. Suicide bombings, waves of refugees, Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin, the mainstream media, social justice, critical race theory, COVID-19, even Brexit. Yet those in control seem unable to deal with it. No one has any vision of a different or a better kind of future. This is a story about how over the past 40 years, politicians, finances and technological utopians, rather than face up to the real complexities of the world, retreated. Instead they constructed a simpler version of the world, in order to hang on to power. And as this fake world grew, all of us went along with it, because the simplicity was reassuring. Even those who thought they were attacking the system, the radicals, the artists, the musicians, and our whole counterculture, actually became part of the trickery, because they too have retreated into the make-believe world, which is why their opposition has no effect, and nothing ever changes. But this retreat into a dream world allowed dark and destructive forces to fester and grow outside. Forces that are now returning to pierce the fragile surface of our carefully constructed fake world. The story begins in two cities at the same moment in 1975. One is New York. The other is Damascus. It was a moment when two ideas about how it might be possible to run the world without politics, first took hold. In 1975, New York City was on the verge of collapse. For 30 years, the politicians who ran the city had borrowed more and more money from the banks to pay for its growing services and welfare. But in the early 70s, the middle class fled from the city. The taxes they paid disappeared with them. So the banks lent the city even more. But then they began to get worried about the size of the growing debt, and whether the city would ever be able to pay it back. Then one day in 1975, the banks just stopped. The city held its regular meeting to issue bonds in return for the loans overseen by the city's financial controller. Today the city of New York is offering for competitive bidding sale 260 million tax anticipation notes, of which 100 million will mature on June 3rd, 1975. The banks were supposed to turn up at 11 a.m., but it soon became clear that none of them were going to appear. The meeting was rescheduled for 2 p.m. and the banks promised they would turn out. The announcement on behalf of the controller is that the offer, which we had expected to receive and announce at 2 o'clock this afternoon, is now expected at 4 o'clock. Paul, does this mean that uh, so far nobody wants those bonds? We will be making a further announcement at 4 o'clock, and anything further that I could say now I think would not advance the interest of the sale, which is now in progress. Does this mean that you have not been able to sell them so far today? We will have a further announcement at 4 o'clock. What happened that day in New York marked a radical shift in power. The banks insisted that in order to protect their loans, they should be allowed to take control of the city. The city appealed to the president, but he refused to help. A new committee was set up to manage the city's finances. Out of nine members, eight of them were bankers, 
which was the start of an extraordinary experiment where the financial institutions took power away from the politicians and started to run society themselves. The city had no other option. The bankers enforced what was called austerity in the city, insisting that thousands of teachers, policemen and firemen were sacked. This was a new kind of politics. The old politicians believed that crises were solved through negotiations and deals. The bankers had a completely different view. They were just the representatives of something that couldn't be negotiated with the logic of the market. To them, there was no alternative to this system. It should run society. But the extraordinary thing was, no one opposed the banks. The radicals and the left-wingers who, ten years before, had dreamt of changing America through revolution, did nothing. They had retreated, and were living in the abandoned buildings in Manhattan. The singer, Patti Smith, later described the mood of disillusion that had come over them. I could not identify with the political movements any longer, she said. All the manic activity in the streets and trying to join them, I felt overwhelmed by yet another form of bureaucracy. What she was describing was the rise of a new, powerful phenomenon that could not fit with the idea of collective political action. Instead, Patti Smith and many others became a new kind of individual radical who watched the decaying city with a cool detachment. They didn't try and change it. They just experienced it. Instead, radicals across America turned to art and music as a means of expressing their criticism of society. Oh, there's a lot of things like when you pass by big movie houses, maybe we'll find one, but they have little movie screens where you can see clips of like Z or something like that. People watch it over and over. I've seen people, I've checked them out all day. I've gone back and forth and they're still there watching the credits of a, of a movie because they don't have enough dough, but it's some entertainment, you know? They believed that, instead of trying to change the world outside, the new radicalism should try and change what was inside people's heads. The way to do this was through self-expression, not collective action. But some of the left saw that something else was really going on. That by detaching themselves and retreating into an ironic coolness, a whole generation were beginning to lose touch with the reality of power. One of them wrote at the time, it was the mood of the era, and the revolution was deferred indefinitely. And while we were dozing, the money crept in. But one of the people who did understand how to use this new power was Donald Trump. Trump realized that there was now no future in building housing for ordinary people, because all the government grants have gone. But he saw that there were other ways to get vast amounts of money out of the state. Trump started to buy up derelict buildings in New York City. And he announced that he was going to transform them into luxury hotels and apartments. But in return, he negotiated the biggest tax break in New York's history with $160 million. The city had to agree because they were desperate. And the banks, seeing a new opportunity, also started to lend him money. And Donald Trump began to transform New York into a city for the rich. At the very same time in 1975, there was a confrontation between two powerful men in Damascus, the capital of Syria. One was Henry Kissinger, the US Secretary of State. The other was the president of Syria, Hafez al-Assad. The battle between the two men was going to have profound consequences for the world. 
and like in New York, it was going to be a struggle between the old idea of using politics to change the world and a new idea that you could run the world as a stable system. President Assad dominated Syria. The country was full of giant images and statues that glorified him. He was brutal and ruthless, killing or imprisoning anyone he suspected of being a threat. But Assad believed that the violence was for a purpose. He wanted to find a way of uniting the Arab countries and using that power to stand up to the West. Kissinger was also tough and ruthless. He had started in the 1950s as an expert in the theory of nuclear strategy, which was called the delicate balance of terror. It was the system that ran the Cold War. Both sides believed that if they attacked, the other side would immediately launch their missiles and everyone would be annihilated. Henry was not a warm, friendly, modest, jovial sort of person. He was thought of as one of the more uh, anxious, temperamental, self-conscious, ambitious, inconsiderate people at Harvard. Kissinger saw himself as a hard realist he had no time for the emotional turmoil of political ideologies. He believed that history had always really been a struggle for power between groups of nations. But what Kissinger took from the Cold War was a way of seeing the world as an interconnected system. And his aim was to keep that system in balance and prevent it from falling into chaos. And it was this idea that Kissinger set out to impose on the chaotic politics of the Middle East. With all the dislocations we now, now experience, there also exists an extraordinary opportunity to form for the first time in history a truly global society carried up by the principle of interdependence. And if we act wisely and with vision, I think we can look back to all this turmoil as the birth pangs of a more creative and better system. If we miss the opportunity, I think there's going to be chaos. To manage it, he knew that he was going to have to deal with President Assad of Syria. President Assad was convinced that there would only ever be a real and lasting peace between the Arabs and Israel if the Palestinian refugees were allowed to return to their homeland. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were living in exile in Syria, as well as in the Lebanon and Jordan. Assad also believed that such a peace would strengthen the Arab world. Have you found that the Palestinians here want to integrate with the Syrians at oh, all? Oh, no, no, never. They don't want not here or neither in Lebanon or in Jordan, never. No, because they want to, to stay as, as a whole, as a Palestinian as uh, they call themselves those who go back, El Aidun, they say in, in, in Arabic. But Kissinger thought that strengthening the Arabs would destabilize his balance of power. So he set out to do the very opposite, to fracture the power of the Arab countries by dividing and breaking their alliances, so they would keep each other in check. Kissinger now played a double game, whereas he termed it constructive ambiguity. In a series of meetings, he persuaded Egypt to sign a separate agreement with Israel. But at the same time, he led Assad to believe that he was working for a wider piece of work, one that would include the Palestinians. In reality, the Palestinians were ignored. They were irrelevant to the structural battles of the global system. When Assad found out the truth, it was too late. 
In a series of confrontations with Kissinger in Damascus, Assad raged about this treachery. He told Kissinger that what he had done would release demons hidden under the surface of the Arab world. Kissinger described that Assad's controlled fury, he wrote, was all the more impressive for its eerily cold, seemingly unemotional demeanor. Assad now retreated. He started to build a giant palace that loomed over Damascus, and his belief that it would be possible to transform the world began to fade. A British journalist who knew Assad wrote, Assad's optimism has gone. Their trust in the future has gone. What has emerged instead was a brutal, vengeful Assad, who believes in nothing except revenge. The original dream of the Soviet Union had been to create a glorious new world. A world where not only the system, but the people themselves would be transformed. They would become new and better kinds of human beings. By the 1980s, it was clear that the dream had failed. The Soviet Union became instead a society where no one believed in anything. No real vision of the future. А если у вас было желание, какое бы снимать вы выразить сейчас? Чего? Желание, если у вас есть, например, какое у вас было бы сейчас? Чего? Желание, мечта. Мечта? Да. Ну как вам сказать? Не знаю даже, что вам сказать. Странная прическа. Где их тебя так красиво подстригли? Знакомлюсь с панками московскими, они подстригли. А что это за течение это панки? Ну, это люди, которые любят свободу, там тебя подносили. Там. А ты не свободна, да? Свободна. Ну, мне кажется, у тебя что-то случилось. Да, у меня ничего не У меня ничего не Ясно. Потом тогда расскажешь. Потом я понимаю, что тебе сейчас трудно говорить. В следующий раз расскажешь. Я повторяю десять раз и снова. Никто не знает, как же мне это лёво. И телевизор с потолка свисает. И какую он мне никто не знает. Все это до того подзаебало, что хочется опять начать сначала. Куплет печальный, он такой, что снова я повторяю. Those around the Soviet Union had believed that they could plan and manage a new kind of socialist society. They had discovered that it was impossible to control and predict everything, and the plan had run out of control. But rather than reveal this, 
the technocrats began to pretend that everything was still going according to plan. And what emerged instead was a fake version of society. The Soviet Union became a society where everyone knew that what their leaders said was not real. Because they could see with their own eyes that the economy was falling apart. But everybody had to play along and pretend that it was real. Because no one could imagine any alternative. One Soviet writer coined a new word for such a phenomenon. Hypernormalization. You were so much a part of the system that it was impossible to see beyond it. The fakeness was hypernormal. In this stagnant world, two brothers, known as Arkady and Boris Strugatsky, became the inspiration of a growing new dissident movement. They weren't politicians, they were science fiction writers. And in their stories, they expressed the strange mood that was rising up as the Soviet Empire collapsed. Their most famous book was called Roadside Picnic. It is set in a world that seems like the present, except there is a zone that has been created by an alien force. People known as stalkers go into the zone. They find that nothing is what it seems, that reality changes minute by minute. Shadows go the wrong way. There are hidden forces that twist your body and change the way you think and feel. The picture the Strugatskys gave was of a world where nothing was fixed. Both what you saw and what you believe had become shifting and unstable. And in 1979, the film director, Andrei Tarkovsky made a film that was based on Roadside Picnic. Что случилось? Зачем вы меня остановили? Я вас не останавливал. А кто? Вы? Черт его. The new president of America had a new vision of the world. It wasn't the harsh realism of Henry Kissinger any longer, which was different. It was a simple moral crusade where America had a special destiny, to fighting evil and to make the world a better place. The places and the periods in which man has known freedom are few and far between. Just scattered moments on the span of time. And most of those moments have been ours. The American people have a genius for great and unselfish deeds. Into the hands of America, God has placed the destiny of an afflicted mankind. God bless America. But this crusade was going to lead Reagan to come face to face with Henry Kissinger's legacy, and above all, the vengeful fury of President Assad of Syria. Israel was now determined to finally destroy the power of the Palestinians. But in 1982, they sent a massive army to encircle the Palestinian accounts in the Lebanon. How strong the Israelis are. Do you know how many, how many tanks they have outside Beirut? Do you know how strong they are? 
يعني بيقول انه احنا بنعرف انه الاسرائيليين اقوياء فهل هذا بياثر علينا؟ سوري اسرائيل وامريكا وكل دول العالم ما بتاثر علينا طول ما سلاحنا بايدنا ولا اي دوله في العالم بتقدر تحاربنا وي ار نوت ريدي تو سرندر الشعب طول ما هو الشعب رافع راسه والشعب معنا ما حدا بيقدرنا طلع شب يان 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 Two months later, thousands of Palestinian refugees were massacred. It horrified the world. But what was even more shocking was that Israel allowed it to happen. Its troops sat by and watched as a Christian Lebanese faction murdered the Palestinians. This was the first of the massacres we discovered yesterday. Now, 24 hours later, the stench here is appalling. But the effects on the Israelis of what their Christian allies did here, and in dozens of other places around this camp, are going to be immense. There's always been a risk of such massacres if Christian militiamen were allowed to come into Palestinian camps. And the Israelis seem to have done nothing to prevent them coming into this one. In the face of the horror of the growing chaos, President Reagan was forced to act. He announced that American Marines would come to Beirut to lead a peacekeeping force. Reagan insisted the troops were neutral, but President Assad was convinced of another reality. He saw the troops as part of the growing conspiracy between America and Israel to divide the Middle East into factions and destroy the power of the Arabs. Assad decided to get the Americans out of the Middle East. And to do this, he made an alliance with a new, revolutionary force of Ruhollah Khomeini's Iran. And what Khomeini could bring to Assad was an extraordinary new weapon he had just created. It was called the poor man's atomic bomb. Ruhollah Khomeini had come to power two years before, as the leader of the Iranian Revolution. But his hold on power was precarious. But Khomeini had developed a new idea on how to fight his enemies and defend the revolution. Khomeini told his followers that they could destroy themselves in order to save the revolution, providing that in the process they killed as many around them as possible. This was completely new, because the Quran specifically prohibits suicide. In the past, you became a martyr on the battlefield, because God chose the time and place of your death. But Khomeini changed this. He did it by going back to one of the central rituals of Shia Islam. Every year, Shiites march in a procession, mourning the sacrifice of their founder, Arsene. As they do, they whip themselves, symbolically reenacting Arsene's suffering. Khomeini said that the ultimate act of penance was not just to whip yourself, but to kill yourself, provided it was for the greater good of the revolution. Khomeini mobilized this force when the country was attacked by Iraq. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, good afternoon. 
an Iraqi Soviet-made MiG-23 was shot down by the Air Force jet fighters of the Islamic Republic over the northwestern Iranian border region of Marivan at 10.08 hours local time Saturday, said the Joint Staff Command's communique numbered 1710. Iran faced almost certain defeat because Iraq had far superior weapons, many of which were supplied by America. So the revolutionaries took tens of thousands of young boys out of schools, put them on buses and sent them to the front lines. Their job was to walk through the enemy's minefields, deliberately blowing themselves up in order to open gaps that would allow the Iranian army to pass through unharmed. It was organized suicide on a vast scale. This human sacrifice was commemorated in giant cemeteries across the country. Fountains flowing blood-red water glorified this new kind of martyrdom. It was this new idea of an unstoppable human weapon that President Assad took from Khomeini and brought to the West for the first time. But as it traveled, it will mutate into something even more deadly. Instead of just killing yourself, you would take explosives with you into the heart of the enemy and then blow yourself up taking dozens or even hundreds along with you. It would become known as suicide bombing. In October 1983, two suicide bombers drove trucks into the U.S. Marine barracks in Beirut. It was seeing something move that took me out of my trance. And then I recognized, oh yes, Marines were in that building. A lot of Marines were in that building. And that's when I ran down and and it was a black, black Marine. He looked white. The dust, it just covered him. The massive explosion killed 241 Americans. The bombers were members of a new militant group that no one had heard of. They called themselves Hezbollah. And although many of them were Iranian, they were very much under the control of Syria and the Syrian intelligence agencies. President Assad was using them as his proxies to attack America. Whoever carried out yesterday's bombings, Shia, Muslim fanatics, devotees of the Ayatollah Khomeini or whatever, it is Syria who profits politically. The most significant fact is that the dissidents live and work with Syrian protection. So it is to Syria, rather than to the dissident group's guiding light, Ayatollah Khomeini of Iran, that we must look for an explanation of the group's activities. Destabilization is Syria's Middle Eastern way of reminding the world that Syria must not be left out of plans for the future of the area. Our sorrow and grief over the loss of those splendid young men and the injury to so many others these deeds make so evident the bestial nature of those who would assume power if they could have their way and drive us out of that area. But despite his words, within four months, President Reagan withdrew all the American troops from the Lebanon. Secretary of State George Shultz explained, We became paralyzed by the complexity that we faced, he said. So the Americans turned and left. For President Assad, it was an extraordinary achievement. He was the only Arab leader to have defeated the Americans and forced them to leave the Middle East. He had done it by using the new force of suicide bombing. A force that once unleashed was going to spread with unstoppable power. But at this point, both Assad and the Iranians thought that they could control it 
and what gave it this extraordinary power was that it held out the dream of transcending the corruptions of the world and entering a new and better world. One should defend the realm of Islam and Muslims against heretics and invaders. And to fulfill this duty, one should even sacrifice one's life. We believe that martyrs can overlook our deeds from the other world. It means that after death, the martyr lives and can still witness this world. By the middle of the 1980s, the banks were rising up and becoming ever more powerful in America. Ten years before in New York, the idea that the financial system could run society began to spread. But unlike older systems, it was mostly invisible. A writer called William Gibson tried to dramatize what was happening in a powerful, imaginative way in a series of novels. Gibson had noticed how the banks and the new corporations were beginning to link themselves together through computer systems. What they were creating was a series of giant networks of information, which were invisible to ordinary people and to the politicians. But those networks gave the corporations extraordinary new powers of control. Gibson gave this new world a name. He called it cyberspace, and his novels described a future that was dangerous and frightening. Hackers could literally enter into cyberspace, and as they did, they traveled through systems that were so powerful that they could reach out and crush intruders by destroying their minds. In cyberspace, there were no laws and no politicians to protect you, just raw, brutal corporate power. But then, a strange thing happened. A new group of visionaries in America took Gibson's idea of a hidden, secret world and transformed it into something completely different. They turned it into a dream of a new utopia. They were the technological utopians who were rising up on the west coast of America. They turned Gibson's idea on its head. Instead of cyberspace being a frightening place, dominated by powerful corporations, they reinvented it as the very opposite. A new, safe world, where radical dreams could come true. Ten years before, faced by the complexity of real politics, the radicals had given up on the idea of changing the world. But now, the computer utopians saw in cyberspace an alternative reality, a place where they could retreat, away from the harsh politics that now dominated Reagan's America. The roots of this vision laid back in the counterculture of the 1960s, and above all, with LSD. Many of those who had taken LSD in the 60s were convinced it was more than just another drug, that it opened human perception and allowed people to see new realities normally hidden from view. It freed them from the narrow, limited view of the world that was imposed onto them by politicians and those in power. In the United States, in the next 5, 10, 50 years, you're going to see more and more people taking LSD and making it a part of their lives. So there will be an LSD country in 50 years, an LSD society. Uh, there'll be less interest in, uh, obviously, warfare, in power politics. You know, politics today is a disease that's a real addiction. Politics, 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 politics. Don't politic. Don't vote. These are old men's games. Impotent and senile old men that want to put you onto their uh, old chess games of war and power. 20 years later, the new networks of machines seem to offer a way to construct a real, alternate reality. Not just one that was chemically induced, 
but a space that actually existed in a parallel dimension to the real world. And like with acid, cyberspace could be a place where you would be liberated from the old corrupt hierarchies of politics and power, and explore new ways of being. One of the leading exponents of this idea was called John Perry Barlow. In the 60s, he had written songs for the Grateful Dead and had been a part of the acid counterculture. He then began to organize what he called Cyber Thor. It was an attempt to try and bring to life the cyberspace movement. Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. I declare the global social space we are building to be naturally independent of the tyrannies you seek to impose on us. Cyberspace does not lie within your borders. Do not think that you can build it as though it were a public works project. You cannot. It is an act of nature and it grows itself through our collective actions. Cyberspace consists of transactions, relationships, and thought itself. Ours is a world that is both everywhere and nowhere, but it is not where bodies live. We are creating a world that all may enter without privilege or prejudice accorded by race, economic power, military force, or station of birth. We are creating a world where anyone, anywhere, may express his or her beliefs, no matter how singular, without fear of being coerced into silence or conformity. Your legal concepts of property, expression, identity, movement, and context do not apply to us. You are terrified of your own children. Because you fear them, you entrust your bureaucracies with the parental responsibilities you are too cowardly to confront yourselves. In China, Germany, France, Russia, Singapore, Italy, and the United States, you are trying to ward off the virus of liberty by erecting guard posts at the frontiers of cyberspace. These may keep out the contagion for a small time, but they will not work in a world that will soon be blanketed with bit-bearing media. Your increasingly obsolete information industries would perpetuate themselves by proposing laws in America and elsewhere that claim to own speech itself throughout the world. These laws would declare ideas to be another industrial product no more noble than pig iron. In our world, Whatever the human mind may create can be reproduced and distributed infinitely at no cost. The global conveyance of thought no longer requires your factories to accomplish. These increasingly hostile and colonial measures place us in the same position as those previous lovers of freedom and self-determination who had to reject the authorities of distant, uninformed powers. We must declare our virtual selves immune to your sovereignty, even as we continue to consent to your rule over our bodies. We will spread ourselves across the planet so that no one can arrest our thoughts. We will create a civilization of the mind in cyberspace. 
May it be more humane and fair than the world your governments have made before. Davos, Switzerland, February 8, 1996. And read in New York City, July 30th, 2013. Two young hackers in New York thought that Barlow was describing a fantasy world. That his vision bore no relationship at all to what was really emerging online. They called themselves Fiber Optic and Acid Freak. And they spent the time exploring and breaking into giant computer networks that they knew were the hard realities of modern digital power. My specific instance, I was charged with conspiracy to commit a few dozen overt acts, they called them, among a number of things having to do with computer trespass and, and I guess, computer eavesdropping, interception, unauthorized access to federal interest computers, which is pretty vague law, communications network computers and, and so on. In a notorious public debate online, the two hackers attacked Barlow. What infuriated the most was Barlow's insistence that there was no hierarchy or controlling powers in the new cyber world. The hackers set out to demonstrate that he was wrong. Acid Freak hacked into the computers of a giant corporation, TRW. TRW had originally built the systems that ran the Cold War and the U.S. military. They had helped create the delicate balance of terror. Now, TRW had adapted their computers to run a new system, that of credit and debt. Their computers gathered up the credit data of millions of Americans and were being used by the banks to decide individuals' credit rating. The hackers broke into the TRW network stole Barlow's credit history and published it online. The hackers were demonstrating the growing power of finance, how the companies that ran the new systems of credit knew more and more about you. And increasingly used that information to control your destiny. The system that was allowing this to happen were a new, giant network of information connected through computer service. Hackers were questioning whether Barlow's utopian rhetoric about cyberspace were really a convenient camouflage. Hiding the emergence of a new and growing power that was way beyond politics. Cyberspace was not the only imaginary story being created. Faced with a humiliating defeat in the Lebanon, President Reagan's government was desperate to shore up the vision of a moral world, where good America struggled against evil. And to do this, they were going to create a simple villain. An imaginary enemy. One that would free them from the paralyzing complexity of real Middle Eastern politics. And the perfect candidate was a Libyan colonel, Muammar Gaddafi, the ruler of Libya. The Americans were going to ruthlessly use Colonel Gaddafi to create a fake terrorist mastermind. And Gaddafi was going to happily play along, because it would turn him into a famous world figure.
Colonel Gaddafi would take power in a coup in the 1970s. But from the very start, he was convinced he was more than just a leader of one country. He believed that he was an international revolutionary, whose destiny was to challenge the power of the West. When he was a young officer, Gaddafi had been sent to England for training. And he had detested the patronizing racism that he said he had found within British society. Yes, I attended the, the course. I have been in England since uh, 1966, from April to August. You had the best month. <laughs> I, I was in Bakansfield, a village called Bakansfield, in uh, uh, Army School. In fact, we ill-treated in that uh, place from uh, some British so, uh, officers. I think uh, those uh, officers uh, were uh, Jews, maybe Jews. But ill-treated in, in what sort of way? In many ways. They ill-treat us uh, every time. By being rude or by being bullying or? In their own uh, behavior towards us, they irritate us. They hate us anyhow because of colonization. It is the result of colonialism. Once in power, Gaddafi had developed his own revolutionary theory, which he called the Third Universal Theory. It was an alternative, he said, to communism and capitalism. He published it in a green book, but practically no one read it. He had sent money and weapons to the IRA in Ireland to help them overthrow the British ruling class. But all the other Arab leaders rejected him and his ideas. They thought that he was mad, and by the mid-1980s, Gaddafi was an isolated figure with no friends or no global impact. Then suddenly, that changed. In December, 1985, terrorists attack Rome and Vienna simultaneously killing 19 people, including five Americans. There was great pressure on President Reagan to retaliate. Get off of your stick, Mr. President. The American people are sick and tired of being kicked around. You talk, cut. Let's say you use some of these billions and billions and billions of dollars worth of weapons that you've asked us to approve. Your words are cheap talk. President Reagan immediately announced that Gaddafi was definitely behind the attacks. These murderers could not carry out their crimes without the sanctuary and support provided by regimes such as Colonel Gaddafi's in Libya. The Rome and Vienna murders are only the latest in a series of brutal terrorist acts committed with Gaddafi's backing. But the European security services who investigated the attacks were convinced that Libya was not involved at all. That the mastermind behind the attacks was in fact Syria and that the terrorists were being directed by the Syrian intelligence agencies. But the Americans say that the attack at Rome airport was organized by Gaddafi not by Damascus. No, what we, do you we, say? We, 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 we don't have any, any evidence. You have no evidence? Supporting such a, such a uh, affirmation. The only evidence we have show, shows a, a, a Syrian connection. Do you say that it was Libya and the president said the evidence of, of Libya's culpability was irrefutable? Yeah. But the Italian authorities to whom I have spoken say emphatically on the record that their investigations have shown that it was entirely masterminded by Syria. I don't agree with that at all. Well, they've invest interrogated the surviving uh, terrorists. I must just say I don't agree with that. But you've no evidence that Libya was in on the planning either. Our evidence on Libya is 
uh, circumstantial but very strong. But why does the president then say it's irrefutable if you call it circumstantial? Well, people can be convicted and sentenced in our courts on circumstantial evidence. But what made it even more confusing was that, although there seemed to be no evidence that Gaddafi had been behind the attacks, he made no attempt to deny the allegation. Instead, he went the other way and turned the crisis into a global drama. Threatening suicide attacks against America, this hostile position can only be explained in, a, in racist and crusade terms. And the heavy, uh... Suicidal attacks will have to be an answer to a military uh, attack. But Libya is not affected by such measures that Reagan has declared. Stinking rotten crusader. Gaddafi now started to play a role that was going to become very familiar. He grabbed the publicity that had been given to him by the Americans and used it dramatically. He promoted himself as an international revolutionary who would help to liberate oppressed peoples around the world. Even the blacks in America. Gaddafi arranged for a live satellite link to a mass meeting of the Nation of Islam in Chicago. Sisters, it is with great honor and privilege that I present to you the leader of the Al Fatah revolution from Libya, our brother Muammar al Gaddafi. Gaddafi told them that Libya was now their ally in their struggle against white America. With my full support and support of my country to your struggle for freedom, for emancipation. Gaddafi promised that he would supply weapons to create a black army in America of 400,000 men. If white America refuses to accept blacks as U.S. citizens, it must therefore be destroyed. Gaddafi also invited a group of German rocket scientists to come to Libya to build him a rocket. He insisted it had no military purpose. Libya was now going to explore outer space. I think it is peaceful and uh, civil, uh, civilian, civilian, civilian activity. For investigation of space and something like this, and uh, it has nothing to do with any uh, military uh, things. But no one believed him. Journalists warned that Gaddafi was really preparing to attack Europe, vividly dramatizing the new danger. That is something like this, which goes that way to put something into space. But the same device tilted, say, to an angle of 45 degrees could, of course, become something very different. A missile possibly carrying a warhead. That would put Libya within range of an enormous area. A chilling proposition with its range of 2,000 kilometers. The Americans and Gaddafi now became locked together in a cycle of mutual reinforcement. In the process, a powerful new image was created that was going to capture the imagination of the West. Gaddafi became a global superpower, a head of what was called a rogue state. A madman who threatened the stability of the world, and Gaddafi was loving every minute of it. Does he think in the past, his decisions sometimes have been taken too quickly? Maybe. On world affairs. Maybe. I think sometimes that is what has made people in the world nervous of you, perhaps. Then, there was another terrorist attack. There was an attack at a disco in West Berlin. The bomb killed an American soldier and injured hundreds. The Americans released what they said were intercepts by the National Security Agency that proved that Colonel Gaddafi was behind the bombing. And a dossier that they said proved that he was also the mastermind behind a whole range of other attacks. President Reagan ordered the Pentagon to prepare to bomb Libya, but again, there were doubts. 
this time, within the American government itself. There were concerns that analysts were being pressured to make a case that didn't really exist. And to do it, they were taking Gaddafi's rhetoric about himself, as a global revolutionary, and his manic ravings, and then representing them as fact. And in the process, together, the Americans and Gaddafi were constructing a fictional world. Certainly, I'm convinced, uh, he pressured into uh, developing a prima facie case against uh, the Libyan government. From the um, somewhat incoherent ravings of a maniac, um, both uh, interceptions of a clandestine nature, interceptions of a uh, uh, open radio broadcast or whatever, um, as well as other sources, quotations of his, that one can assemble a um, neatly put together package demonstrating that the man had uh, violent interests against the United States and uh, its European allies. The European intelligence agencies has told the Americans that they were wrong, that it was Syria that was behind the bombing, and not Libya. But the Americans decided to attack Libya because they couldn't face the dangerous consequences of attacking Syria. Instead, they went for Gaddafi, a man without friends or allies. Libya had were less uh, downside consequences, if you will. There's less Arab support for Gaddafi. We figured there would be less Soviet support for Gaddafi. And there's no question but what Libya was more vulnerable than Syria and Iran. And that is certainly an element uh, of force. In April 1986, the Americans attacked Libya. The targets included Colonel Gaddafi's own house. Immediately after the attack, Gaddafi appeared in the ruins to describe what had happened. The family were asleep, and my wife was, that day, tied down to the bed because she had a slip disc. I tried to rescue the children, and the house started to collapse, as you can see, and the books started to burn. They concentrated on the children's room, so that they would kill all the children. Our small adopted daughter was killed, and two of our children were injured. But yet again, Gaddafi might have been lying. Ever since then, there have been rumors that his adopted daughter might have actually survived. But many other children were killed in the raid because the American bombing was so inaccurate. Gaddafi realized that the attention of the whole world was now focused on him, and he grabbed the mood to promote his own revolutionary theory, the third way, as a global alternative to democracy. That I am really responsible for conveying the third world theory and the Green Book to the rising generation, to the young American and British people so that we can rescue America and Britain and these generations of young people from this theory which, this electoral party theory, which enabled an imbecile like Reagan to rule the mightiest power on earth and use it to destroy other people's homes and enable the harlot like Thatcher to rule a great nation like Britain. What is 
In the 1980s, more and more people in the United States were reporting seeing unexplained objects and lights in the sky. At the same time, investigators who believed in UFOs revealed that they had discovered top secret government documents stated that alien craft had visited Earth. Documents had been hidden for 20 years, and they seemed to prove that there had been a giant cover up. But the reality of this phenomenon was even stranger. The American government had been fabricating the entire narrative surrounding the UFO phenomenon, at least in America. That they had created a fake conspiracy to deliberately mislead the population. The lights that people imagined were UFOs were in reality new, high-tech weapons the US government was testing at the time. The government had developed the weapons because they in turn Imagine the Soviet Union was far stronger than it was, and still wanted to conquer the world. The government wanted to keep the weapons secret, but they couldn't always hide their appearance in the skies. So it is alleged that they chose a number of people to use to spread the rumor that these were really alien visitations. One of those chosen was Paul Benefits, who lived outside a giant air base in New Mexico and had noticed strange things going on. Years later, years later, years later, I sat down with Paul at dinner and told Paul exactly that everything we did was a sanctioned counterintelligence operation to convince him that what he was seeing was UFOs and that what, what we didn't want him to know was that he tapped into something on the base and we, we didn't want him to ever disclose that. We kind of planted the seed in Paul that what he was seeing and what he was hearing and what he was collecting was, in fact, probably maybe UFOs. Benefits and others chosen by the agency were, it is alleged, given a series of forged documents. Many of them were top secret memos by the military describing sightings of unidentified aerial vehicles. The documents spread like wildfire. They formed a basis for the wave of belief in UFOs that would spread through America in the 1990s. This footage, for example, is similar to its modern counterpart. In reality, they were just rockets, either breaking up in the upper atmosphere or launching after dusk, reflecting sunlight back to confused viewers on the ground. The Falcon 9 rockets are the latest in rocket technology, having the ability to land themselves. They are an example of what happens when fast-moving objects pierce the Earth's upper atmosphere. also contributed to the wider growing belief that governments lied to you and that conspiracies were real. What the Reagan administration would do, both with Colonel Gaddafi and with the UFOs, was a blurring of fact and fiction. But it was part of an even broader program. The president's advisors had given it a name. They called it perception management and it became a central part of the American government during the 1980s. The aim was to tell dramatic stories that grabbed the public imagination, not just about the Middle East, but about Central America and the Soviet Union. And it didn't matter if the stories were true or not, providing the distraction people and the politicians from having to deal with the intractable complexities of the real world. Reality became less and less of an important factor in American politics. It wasn't what was real uh, that was driving anything, or the facts driving anything. It was how you could turn those facts, or twist the facts, or even make up the facts, to make your opponent look bad. So perception management became a, 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 a device, and the facts could be twisted. Anything could be anything. It becomes, how can you manipulate the American people? And in the process, reality becomes what? 
Reality becomes simply something to play with to achieve that end. Reality is not important in this context. Reality is simply something that you handle. But something was about to happen that would demonstrate dramatically just how far the American government had detached from reality. The Soviet empire was about to implode. And no one, none of the politicians, or the journalists, or the think tank experts, or the economists, or the academics, saw it coming. The collapse of the Soviet Union had a powerful effect on the West. For many, it symbolized the final failure of the dream that politics could be used to build a new kind of world. What was going to emerge instead was a new system that had nothing to do with politics, a system whose aim was not to try and change things, but rather to manage a post-political world. One of the first people to describe this dramatic change was a German political thinker called Ulrich Beck. Beck said that any politician who believed that they could take control of society and drive it forward to build a better future, was now seen as dangerous. In the past politicians might have been able to do this, but now they were faced with what he called the runaway world. Where things were so complex and interconnected, and modern technologies, so potentially dangerous that it was impossible to predict the outcomes of anything you did. The catalogue of environmental disasters proved this. Politicians would have to give up any idea of trying to change the world. Instead, their new aim would be to try and predict the dangers in the future, then find ways to avoid those risks. The picture Beck gave was of a political class reduced trying to steer society into a dark and frightening future, constantly peering forward and trying to see the risks coming towards them. The only aim, to avoid those risks and keep society stable. But a system that could anticipate the future and keep society stable was already being built. Pieced together from all kinds of different and sometimes surprising sources, all of them outside politics. One part of it was taking shape in a tiny town in the far northwest of the United States called East Wenatchee. 
It was a giant computer whose job was to make the future predictable. The man building it was a banker called Larry Fink. Back in 1986, Mr. Fink's career had collapsed. He lost $100 million in a deal and had been sacked. He became determined that it wouldn't happen again. Fink started a company called Black Rock and builds a computer he called Aladdin. It is housed in a series of large sheds in the apple orchards outside Wenatchee. Fink's aim was to use the computer to predict with certainty what the risk of any deal or investment was going to be. The computer constantly monitors the world, and it takes things that it sees happening, and then compares them to events in the past. It can do this because it has in its memory a vast history of the past 50 years. Not just financial, but all kinds of events. And out of the millions and millions of correlations, the computer then spots possible disasters, possible dangers lying in the future, and moves the investments to avoid any radical change and keep the system stable. Today I'm going to deliver 1.8 million reports. Execute 25,000 reports and avert 3,000 disasters. I'm going to monitor interest rates in Europe. Silver prices in Europe drops in the Midwest. I'm going to witness 4 million shares change hands in the New York Stock Exchange. And record the effects on 14 trillion in assets plus 20,000 holders. I am Aladdin. I am Aladdin. And today, I'll find the numbers behind it. I will see the trends in the Monday state. The connections. The risks. I am Aladdin. I am Aladdin, and I will get the data right. I have 25 million lines of code. Written by hundreds of people. Across two decades. I'm smarter than any algorithm. More powerful than any process. Because I am Aladdin. Because I am Aladdin. Aladdin had proved to be incredibly successful. The assets it guides and controls now amount up to $15 trillion, which is 7% of the world's total wealth. Wenatchee was also a dramatic example of another kind of craving for stability and reassurance. More of its citizens took Prozac than practically any other town in America. When a person's central nervous system is changed by an SSRI with that medicine, they will view things differently, and they will be strangers. They look at things differently. I have a chemical up here that changes me. I think differently. For me, it was like walking around like this for my whole life, and really not knowing that I was nearsighted. I mean, really. I mean, no one had ever offered me glasses. And then all of a sudden, here comes uh, somebody that says, okay, now try these on, try this Prozac on. And I tried it on, and for the first time in my life, I went, whoa, is this the way reality really is? your perception can be changed. And, and it's frightening, it's scary to people. It's, it's, it speaks of science fiction almost. Well, the medicine just kind of lets you be, you listen to what needs to go on. And then your doctor, you know, every time you come back, he says, oh, you're looking so much better. And then he just like, jam, he, every time I go in, he goes, you are so beautiful, you know? And he isn't even sucking up. I mean, he's being nice, you know. You're beautiful, you're nice, you're friendly, you've got so much going for you. I think, yeah, I do, yeah. So I go out and I tell my friends, oh, I feel much, so much better about myself. You know, mom goes out, oh, I feel so much better about myself. So your friends start saying, you know, I've seen such an improvement. I've seen such improvement. And everybody improves all the way around. They see improvement, you know, it's like everybody's kind of brainwashing each other into being happy. But there was a more effective way of reassuring people that was being developed that did not involve medication. It too came from computer systems, artificial intelligence. But the way to do it had been discovered by accident. Back in the 1960s, there had been optimistic dreams that it would be possible to develop computers that could think like human beings. Scientists then spent years trying to program the rules that govern human thought. 
but they never worked. One computer scientist at MIT became so disillusioned that he decided to build a computer program that would parody these hopeless attempts. He was called Joseph Weizenbaum, and he built what he claimed was a computer psychotherapist. Just like a therapist, people could come and talk to the machine by typing in their problems. Weizenbaum called the program Eliza. He modeled it on a real psychotherapist called Carl Rogers who was famous for simply repeating back to the patient what they had just said. That is what Eliza did. The patient sat in front of the screen and typed in what they were feeling. The program repeated it back to them often in the form of a question. Men are all alike. In what way? They're always bugging us about something or other. Can you think of a specific example? Well, my boyfriend made me come here. Your boyfriend made you come here? He says um, I'm depressed much of the time. I'm sorry to hear that you're depressed. It's true. I am unhappy. Do you think coming here will help you not to be unhappy? Well, I need some help. That much seems certain. One of the first people to use Eliza was Weizenbaum's secretary, and her reaction was something that he had not predicted. And I asked her to my office and sat her down at the keyboard, and then she began to type. And of course, I looked over her shoulder to make sure that everything was operating properly. After two or three interchanges with the, with the machine, she turned to me and she said, Would you mind leaving the room, please? And yet she knew, as Weizenbaum did, that Eliza didn't understand a single word that was being typed into it. You're like my father in some ways. You don't argue with me. Why do you think I don't argue with you? You're afraid of me. Does it please you to think I'm afraid of you? My father's afraid of everybody. My father's afraid of everybody. Weizenbaum was astonished. He discovered everyone who tried Eliza became engrossed. They would sit for hours telling the machine about their inner feelings and incredibly intimate details of their lives. They also liked it because it was free of any kind of patronizing elitism. One person said, after all, the computer doesn't burn out, look down on you, or try to have sex with you. What Eliza had shown is that in an age of individualism, what made people feel secure was having themselves reflected back to them, just like in a mirror. Artificial intelligence changed direction and started to create new systems that did just that, but on a giant scale. They were called intelligent agents. They work by monitoring individuals, gathering vast amounts of data about their past behavior, and then looked for patterns and correlations from which they could predict what they would want in the future. It was a system that ordered the world in a way that was centered around you. And in an age of anxious individuals, frightened of the future, that was reassuring, just like Eliza, a safe bubble that protected you from the complexities of the world. But the applications of this new direction prove fruitful and profitable. What was rising up in different ways was a new system that promised to keep the world stable. Its tentacles reached into every area of our lives. Finance promised that it could control the unpredictability of the free market. And individuals were more and more monitored to stabilize their physical and mental states. But increasingly, the intelligent agents online predicted what people would want in the future and how they would behave. And the biggest change was to politics. 
In a world where the overriding aim was now stability, politics became just part of a wider system of managing the world. The old idea of democratic politics, that gave a voice to the weak, was eroded. And a resentment began to grow, out on the edges of society. The new system of connected agents which began to predict our behavior had a dangerous flaw. Because in the real world, not everything can be predicted by reading data from the past. Someone that was about to discover this flaw was a man who personified the meaning of hypernormalization. It was Donald Trump. The story begins when a man, called Jess Markham, received a phone call. It was from Donald Trump, and Trump was desperate for help. Markham was a strange, mysterious figure. He had been a nuclear scientist in the 1950s and studied the effects of radiation from nuclear weapons on the human body. Then Markham had gone to Las Vegas and became obsessed with gambling. He had a photographic memory and he used it to instantly process the data of the games as they were played. Because he could predict the outcome, he always won. The Las Vegas gangsters were fascinated by him. Donald Trump was one of the heroes at the age. But in reality, much of his success was a facade. The banks that had lent Trump millions had discovered that he could no longer pay the interest on his loans. Trump's empire was facing bankruptcy. His wife, Yvonne, hated him because he was having an affair with Miss Hawaiian Tropic 1985. It was then that the unthinkable happened. A famous Japanese gambler, Akio Kashiwagi, came to one of Trump's casinos and started to win millions of dollars in an extraordinary winning streak. Trump, who was desperate for money, panicked as day after day, he watched millions being siphoned out of his casino. So he turned for help from Jess Markham. Markham came to Trump's casino in Atlantic City. He analyzed all the data about the way that Kashiwagi had been playing. He then told Trump to suggest a particular high-stakes game that he knew the Japanese gambler could not resist. He predicted that Kashiwagi had to lose, and after five agonizing days, he did. He lost $10 million and gave up. Donald Trump was elated, and he thought he got his money back. Unfortunately for Trump, before Kashiwagi could pay his debt, he was hacked to death in his kitchen by a Yakuza gang. Donald Trump didn't get his money. Trump's business went bankrupt, and he was forced to sell most of his buildings to the banks. He then married Miss Hawaiian Tropic. In the future, he would sell his name to other people to put on their buildings, and he himself would become a celebrity tycoon. President Assad didn't want stability, he wanted revenge. In December 1988, a bomb exploded on a Pan Am plane over Lockerbie in Scotland. Almost immediately, investigators and journalists pointed the finger at Syria. The bombing had been done, they said, 
in revenge for the Americans' shooting down of an Iranian airliner in the Gulf a few months before. For 18 months, everyone agreed that this was the truth, but then a strange thing happened. The security agencies said that they had been wrong. It hadn't been Syria at all. It was Libya who had been behind the Lockerbie bombing, but many journalists and politicians did not believe it. They were convinced that the switch had happened for the most cynical of reasons. That America and Britain desperately needed Assad as an ally in the coming Gulf War against Saddam Hussein. They blamed Gaddafi as the terrorist mastermind. But Assad was not really in control because he had released forces that no one would be able to control. Syria, of course, was unfortunately accused of many terrorist outrage and of harboring terrorist groups. It appears that we have now restored relations with them, as have the Americans. They are now our friends, although we get no real assurances on the past whatsoever. It strikes me as very strange indeed that many of the things we thought were previously the responsibility of Syria have now dramatically become the responsibility of Libya. The force that 10 years before he had brought from Iran to attack the West, the human bomb was now about to jump like a virus from Shiite to Sunni Islam. In December 1992, the militant group Hamas kidnapped an Israeli border guard and stabbed him to death. The Israeli response was overwhelming. They arrested 450 members of Hamas, put them on buses and took them to the top of a bleak mountain in southern Lebanon. They left them there and refused to allow any humanitarian aid through. But the Israelis had dumped the Hamas militants in an area controlled by Hezbollah. They spent six months there, and during that time they learned from Hezbollah how powerful suicide bombing could be. Hezbollah had told them how they had used it to force the Israelis out of Beirut and back to the border. The first sign that the idea had spread to Hamas was when a group of the devotees marched in protest towards the Israeli border dressed as martyrs. But it soon became more than just theater. Hamas began a wave of suicide attacks in Israel. Hamas sent the bombs into the heart of Israeli cities to blow themselves up and kill as many around them as possible. I didn't want to believe that under my house there is a bomb. And when I realized it's a bomb, I, I started to cry because it was the first time I saw it in Tel Aviv. In doing this, Hamas was going much further than Hezbollah ever had. They were targeting civilians, something that Hezbollah had never done. The tactic shocked the Sunni world. This was something completely alien to its history. Not only did the Quran forbid suicide, but Sunni Islam did not have any rituals of self-sacrifice, unlike the Shiites. The most senior religious leader in Saudi Arabia insisted it was wrong. But a mainstream theologian from Egypt seized the moment. He issued a fatwa that justified the attacks, and he added it was also justified to kill civilians. Because in Israel, everyone, including women, serve as reservists. So really, they are all part of the enemy army. It's not suicide. It is martyrdom in the name of God. Islamic theologians and jurisprudents have debated this issue. Israeli women are not like women in our society, because Israeli women are militarized. Secondly, I consider this type of martyrdom operation as an indication of justice of Allah Almighty. Allah is just. 
Through his infinite wisdom, he has given the weak what the strong do not possess, and that is the ability to turn their bodies into bombs like the Palestinians. Instead, in the Israeli election of 1996, Benjamin Netanyahu took power. He turned against the peace process, which was exactly what Hamas wanted. And from then on the two sides became locked. Ever more horrific cycles of human bombs have destroyed the very thing President Assad had first altered. The real political solution to the Palestinian question. It was just after one o'clock and the market was full of shoppers. Streams of ambulances came to carry away the dead and the injured. It was a place of appalling suffering, but even with the first grief came the immediate political impact on the peace process. It's impossible. This moment it will be the end, must be the end of this bloody peace process. In America, all optimistic visions of the future had begun to disappear. Instead, everyone in society, not just the politicians, but the scientists, the journalists, and all kinds of experts, had begun to focus on the dangers that might be hidden in the future. This in turn creates a pessimistic mood. And with this mood, that obsession with the future began to spread out from the increasingly irrational technocratic world. What emerged was a fundamental change in our culture, to which everyone became possessed by darkness. The growing collective anxiety became paranoid forebodings of a bleak future. And our movies, television, news, and overall cultural narratives reflected this fact.
It was then that the imagination of Hollywood began to pierce the fragile surface of our carefully constructed fake world. FBI agents, and you can see the two towers. A huge explosion now raining debris on all of us. Better get out of the way. The top corners of the power uh, closest to the highway. Obviously, they had two choices to be burned in flames or to uh, leap and end of all. It was quite tragic. And there, as you can see, perhaps the second tower, the front tower, the top portion of which is collapsing. The human bomb was now implemented on a massive scale. It was demonstrated how the terrifying power of this new force could penetrate any defensive system. And it had come to kill thousands of Americans on their own soil. Twenty years before President Reagan had been confronted by the first suicide bombers, they had been unleashed by President Assad to force America out of the Middle East. Rather than confront the complexity of Syria and Israel and the Palestinian problem, America had retreated and left Syria and suicide bombing to fester and mutate. They had gone instead for Colonel Gaddafi and turned him into an evil global terrorist. But in the process, this changed the way people saw and understood terrorism. Instead of a violence born out of political struggles, it became replaced by a much simpler image of an evil tyrant of the head of a rogue state who became more like an arch-villain who wanted to terrorize the world. The politics and power dropped away. The problem was only them and those evil personalities. And after 9-11, this led to a new and equally simple idea that if only you could remove these tyrannical figures, the grateful people of that country would naturally transform naturally into a democracy.
proceed. Because they would be free of the perceived evil, both Tony Blair and George Bush became possessed by the idea of ridding the world of Saddam Hussein. We owe it to the future of civilization not to allow the world's worst leaders to develop and deploy and therefore blackmail free loving countries with the world's worst weapons. We know they've already got chemical and biological weapons there. We know uh, that they're certainly doing their best to acquire nuclear weapons technology. If we allow them to do that and do nothing about it, then I think later generations will consider us deeply irresponsible. So possessed that they believed any story that proved his evil intentions and the line between reality and fiction became ever more blurred. In September 2002, the head of MI6 rushed to Downing Street to tell Blair excitedly that they had finally found the source that confirmed everything. The source, he said, had direct access to Saddam Hussein's chemical weapons program, which was making vast quantities of VX and serine nerve gas. The nerve agents were being loaded into linked hollow glass spheres. But then, someone in MI6 noticed that the detail the source was describing was identical to scenes in the 1996 movie, The Rock, starring Sean Connery and Nicolas Cage. A later report into the Iraq war pointed out glass containers were not typically used in chemical munitions. And the informant had obviously seen a popular movie known as The Rock that had inaccurately depicted nerve agents being carried in glass beads or spheres. Really elegant string of pearls configuration. Unfortunately, incredibly unstable. What exactly does this stuff do? If the rocket renders an aerosol, it can take out the entire city of people. Really? What happens if you drop one? Happily, it'll just wipe out you and me. It's a cholinesterase inhibitor. Stops the brain from sending nerve messages down the spinal cord within 30 seconds. Any epidermal exposure or inhalation, and you'll know. Twinge at the small of your back as the poison seizes your nervous system. Do not move that! Your muscles freeze. You can't breathe. You spasm so hard you break your own back and spit your guts out. But that's after your skin melts off. Oh my God. Well, I think we'd like God on our side at the moment, don't you? There is a threat from Saddam Hussein, and the weapons of mass destruction that he has acquired is not in doubt at all. al-Assad had died in 2000. His son, Bashar al-Assad, became the new president. But he couldn't escape the inexorable logic of what his father had started 20 years before. His father had sent Shiite suicide bombers to attack the Americans in Lebanon. Now, as America and Britain invaded Iraq, Assad would decided that he would copy his father. What he was about to let loose would tear the Arab world apart, and then come back to try and destroy him. Bashar al-Assad was never supposed to have been president. It was always going to have been his elder brother Basil, but before he could take his father's place, Basil had died in a car crash. It was Bashar that succeeded his father, being the next in line, who then moved into the palace his father had built above Damascus. Up to this point, Bashar had not been interested in politics. He was fascinated by computers. He founded the Syrian Computer Society and brought the internet to the country. His favorite band was the Electric Light Orchestra, but now he was president, and he set out to attack America. Bashar Assad was convinced that the invasion of Iraq was just a first step of a plot by the Western powers to take over the whole of the Middle East. He knew that the invasion had outraged many of the radical Islamists in Syria, and what they most wanted to do was to go to Iraq and can kill Americans. 
so Bashar instructed the Syrian intelligence services to help them do this. Syrian agents set up a pipeline that began to feed thousands of militants across the border into the heart of the insurgency. And it grew. Within a year, almost all the foreign fighters from across the world were coming through Syria. And they brought suicide bombing with them. The Americans estimated that 90% of the suicide bombers were foreign fighters, but it began to run out of control. Most of the jihadists joined the group Al-Qaeda in Iraq, but then turned to killing Shiites in an attempt to create a civil war. The force that had originally been invented by the Shiites, suicide bombing, now started to kill them. A moment of silence before people realized what was happening. A few seconds ago, we just had repeated explosions in the street below me. People are now fleeing in terror from the central square around the mosque. This is what everybody feared. We just heard another explosion in the distance. That somebody would try to target this religious festival to try to bring about a sectarian conflict in Iraq. panic, a terrified stampede. But some of these people were running into the next bombs. We counted at least six separate explosions. Tony Blair and George Bush were faced by disaster. Iraq was imploding. While at home, they were being accused of lying to their own people to justify the invasion. What they desperately needed was something that would show them the invasion was having a good effect in the Arab world. So they made an extraordinary decision. They turned for help to the man who they'd always insisted was one of the world's most dangerous tyrants, Colonel Gaddafi. But now, instead of making him the enemy, they set out to make him an ally. It was going to be the largest implementation of perception management. A man who had been created by the West as a fake global terrorist was now going to be turned into a fake hero of democracy and everyone, not just politicians, would become involved. Public relations, academics, television presenters, spies and even musicians were all going to help reinvent Colonel Gaddafi. It would show just how many people in the Western establishment had, at this point, become the engineers of this fake world. Ever since being accused of the Lockerbie bombing, Colonel Gaddafi had been a complete outcast. The West had imposed sanctions on Libya and the economy was falling apart. But then suddenly Tony Blair broke live into the BBC Evening News. Prime Minister Tony Blair is about to make a statement the BBC understands from Downing Street. It's of international significance. He'll be making his statement at any moment. Now we can see pictures of him in Durham, evening, Durham City. Here he is. Colonel Gaddafi has confirmed that Libya has in the past sought to develop weapons of mass destruction capabilities. Libya has now declared its intention to dismantle its weapons of mass destruction completely. This decision by Colonel Gaddafi is an historic one and a courageous one, and I applaud it. Today in Tripoli, the leader of Libya, Colonel Muammar al-Qaddafi, publicly confirmed his commitment to disclose and dismantle all weapons of mass destruction programs in his country. Colonel Qaddafi now became, for Western politicians, a heroic figure.
His decision to give up his weapons of mass destruction seemed to prove that the invasion of Iraq could transform the Middle East, and Tony Blair traveled to meet Gaddafi in his desert tent to welcome him back into what one journalist called the community of civilized nations. But, just as in the past, nothing was what it seemed with Colonel Gaddafi. In reality, Gaddafi did not really have the terrifying weapons of mass destruction that he was promising to destroy. His nuclear program had stuttered to a halt and never produced anything dangerous. He had managed to buy some equipment on the black market, but his technicians had been unable to assemble it. His biological weapons were non-existent. All he had was some old mustard gas in leaking barrels. But now, he had to pretend to have terrifying arsenal of weapons, and the West had to pretend they had avoided another global threat. Soon enough, the made-up stories became even more complicated. As part of the deal, the West said that if Gaddafi admitted that Libya had done the Lockerbie bombing, they would lift the sanctions. But many of those who had investigated Lockerbie were still convinced that Libya wasn't responsible, and that it was Syria who were actually responsible. But Colonel Gaddafi confessed. However, his son Saif was interviewed about this confession. He said that his father was simply pretending that he had been behind the Lockerbie bombing to get the sanctions lifted that new lies were being built on top of old to construct a completely false reality. You have to accept, or you had to accept at that time, the responsibility because you have to accept responsibilities, you have to pay compensation in order to get rid of the sanction. It means we did that not because we are convinced that we did it, but because to find an exit out of this nightmare. So what you're saying is that you accept responsibility, but you're not admitting that you did it? Yes. And this is all a sham, you're saying, just to, just to get sanctions over with so that you can start normal diplomatic relations with okay. the West. Okay. What's wrong with that? It's a very cynical way to, to, to behave as a, as a country, isn't it? Many people would say. <laughs> First of all, I mean, the Americans, the British, they told us to write that letter. They told us to pay compensation. And then they opened their embassies and they restored the relation. And they came to us. It was their game, not our game. Public relations companies then came to Libya to do what they called reframing the narrative. One firm was paid three million dollars to turn Gaddafi into what they described as a modern world thinker. They did this by bringing other famous world thinkers and TV presenters out to Libya to meet the colonel and discuss his theories. Hello and welcome to Libya in the Global Age, a conversation with Muammar Gaddafi. But first, let's get the story so far of Libya. One world thinker was Lord Anthony Giddens. Coincidentally, he had a theory, which he called the Third Way, which had inspired Tony Blair. Colonel Gaddafi had his own theory, which was called the Third Universal Theory. Lord Giddens later wrote about his talks with the Libyan leader. Colonel Gaddafi likes my term the third way, because his own political philosophy is a version of this idea. He makes many intelligent and perceptive points. It was then that Gaddafi had achieved his lifelong dream. He was invited to address the United Nations. 
he spent almost two hours explaining his third universal theory, and also demanded an investigation into the shootings of President Kennedy and Martin Luther King. When he was in New York, Gaddafi was offered a tent, just like the one he had at home in the gardens of a grand mansion. The man who made the offer was Donald Trump. I dealt with Gaddafi. People in Britain and America now began to turn away from politics. The effect of the Iraq war had been very powerful. Not only did millions of people feel that they had been lied to over the weapons of mass destruction, but there was a deeper feeling that whatever they did or said had no effect, that despite the mass protests and the fears and the warnings, the war had happened anyway. Liberals, radicals, and a whole new generation of young people were treated. They turned instead to another world that was free of this hypocrisy and the corruption of politics. They went into cyberspace. Cyberspace had become even more sophisticated and responsive to human interaction. The online world was full of algorithms that could analyze and predict human behavior. The man behind much of this was a scientist named Judea Pearl. He was the godfather of modern artificial intelligence. Pearl's breakthrough had been to utilize a revolutionary new probabilistic graphical model known as a Bayesian belief network. These networks represented a set of variables and their conditional dependencies via a directed acyclic graph. The power from these models made it possible for systems that could predict behavior even when the information was incomplete. But to make the system work, Pearl and others had imported a model of human beings drawn from economics. They had created what were called rational agents, software that mimicked human beings, but in a very simplified form. The model assumed that the agent would always act rationally in order to get what it wants. One of the early utopians of cyberspace, Jaron Lanier, warned of the implications this new kind of cyberspace would have in the real world. The agent's model of what you are interested in would always be a cartoon. And in return, you will see a cartoon version of the world through the agent's eyes. And, he added, it will never be clear who they are working for. You or someone else entirely. New technology began to allow people to upload millions of images and videos into cyberspace. And the web, which up to that point seemed like an abstract other world, began to look and feel like the real world. From videos of animals and personal experiences, to extraordinary events and horrific nightmares, all of it was to be uploaded for all the world to see. However, in a strange and horrific twist, the first terrorist beheading video that was posted online was that of Judea Pearl's own son. He was a journalist for the Wall Street Journal and had been kidnapped by radical Islamists in Pakistan. They recorded what they said was his confession and then his killing.
This was a new world that the old systems of power found very difficult to deal with in the wake of the 9-11 attacks. The security agencies secretly collected data from millions of people online. One of these data collection programs was called Optic Nerve. It took stills from the webcam conversations of millions of people across the world, trying to spot terrorists planning another attack. The program did not discover a single terrorist, but it did discover something else. It would appear that a surprising number of people are using webcam conversations to show intimate parts of their body to each other. But increasingly people were using the internet in other ways to present themselves as they wanted to be seen. The web drew people in because it was mesmerizing. It was somewhere that you could explore and get lost in, in any way you wanted. But behind the screen, liking a two-way mirror, those same rational agents were watching and predicting, while guiding your hand on the mouse. These intelligent systems continued to gather ever more data. New forms of guidance began to take root and a new form of guided control was born. Social media. Complex algorithms looked at what individuals liked, and then fed more of the same. In the process, individuals began to move without noticing into bubbles that isolated them, from enormous amounts of other information. They only heard and saw what they liked and their newsfeeds increasingly excluded anything that might challenge people's pre-existing beliefs. The version of cyberspace that was rising up seemed to be very much like William Gibson's original vision. But behind the superficial freedoms of the internet were a few giant corporations. Their algorithmic systems controlled what people saw and shaped what they thought. What was even more mysterious was how they made decisions about what you should like, what should be hidden from you, and what should not be shown at all to anyone. And the algorithms used by those massive corporations to curate our make-believe world were not just created from thin air. They were created by testing and experimenting on us, the user. Not many knew at the time, but companies like Facebook had begun to run experiments on its users. By manipulating their news feed, they were able to shift the user's mood from one extreme to another. Around 2014, an article was published by The Guardian that outlined something Facebook had done unbeknownst to their users. For one, everyone had a Facebook profile, even those that did not sign up to the website. Facebook used its algorithms to find people who had not signed up by finding connections via phone contacts and image tags. These connections were used to create a shadow profile of those who had not created their own profile. And most of us still have no idea this is happening. But this led to them conducting experiments on its users, trying to find out how much control those news feeds had on their emotion. Facebook claimed the massive psychological experiment it secretly conducted on its users should have been done differently. Shortly afterward they published a new set of guidelines for how it would approach future research studies. However, Mike Schroepfer, chief technology officer, said the company had been unprepared for the negative reactions it received when it published the results of its experiment. And while watchdog groups and concerned experts condemned their efforts in studying the psychological effects of social media, Facebook continued to conduct their research projects with little public ire. It was then in 2012 that Facebook published a study in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Unbeknown to users, Facebook had tampered with the news feeds of nearly 700,000 people, showing them an abnormally low number of either positive or negative posts. 
The experiment aimed to determine whether the company could alter the emotional state of its users. But this was just the beginning. They also conducted other experiments that were made public by Forbes in 2014. They found that emotions could be contagious. When positive expressions in a user's news feed were reduced, they reacted by producing fewer positive posts and increased their negative posts. When negative expressions were reduced, the opposite pattern occurred, according to the paper published by the Facebook research team in the NES. They concluded by asserting that emotions expressed by others on Facebook influence our own emotions, constituting experimental evidence for massive-scale contagion via social networks. The experiment ran for a week from January 11th to the 18th in 2012, during which the hundreds of thousands of Facebook users unknowingly participating may have felt either happier or more depressed than usual as they saw either more of their friends posting things like 15 photos that restore our faith in humanity articles, or despondent status updates about losing jobs, getting screwed over by an airline, or already failing to live up to New Year's resolutions. From rumor cascades to self-censorship, selection effects in online sharing to social influence in social advertising, Facebook conducted many experiments, many of which are not even known to the public. They even conducted a 61 million person experiment in social influence and political mobilization, the results of which proved how much influence these corporations now had on politics all across the planet. But most worrying of all, in 2010 they offered test subjects an I voted button at the top of their news feeds, and included information on how to find their local polling place. Some users were also shown the names of their friends who had clicked the button too. As for the control group, they got no prompt to vote. Once they collected the necessary data, the researchers checked public voting records to see which of the millions actually voted. This experiment confirmed the idea that peer pressure works. People were more likely to click the I voted button if their friends' names appeared there. And when researchers checked actual voting records, they found that people who got the I voted message in their news feed were 0.39% more likely to have actually voted. Thus they were more likely to have voted if their friends' names appeared as well. It might be a minuscule percentage. But the researchers think their experiment resulted in 340,000 votes that wouldn't have otherwise happened. This was the point at which Facebook could identify the effects of their algorithms on a massive scale. Millions of profiles, demographics, locations, and personalities were now available to improve their algorithms via machine learning. What is known as an unsupervised learning algorithm? These algorithms take a set of data that contains only inputs and attempt to find structure within the data, like a grouping or clustering of data points. The algorithms, therefore, learn from test data that has not been labeled, classified or categorized. Instead of responding to feedback, unsupervised learning algorithms identify commonalities in the data and react based on the presence or absence of such commonalities in each new piece of data. It was this kind of prediction that gave these social media corporations their immense power and social influence. With these algorithms, and to the benefit of advertisers, Facebook could predict what kind of product you would want or need before you even knew you wanted it. It is estimated that 5.27 billion people now use a cell phone, more than half of which can use the Facebook app. This gives Facebook access to more than a billion unique profiles to test their algorithms with. And the sheer amount of data gives them the ability to accurately predict when you use the bathroom, or go to bed, or go to work. Every moment you have your phone on you is tracked and catalogued into a larger network that can now be manipulated without anyone noticing. A hidden network, used by millions, understood by only a few, now fed us our news, media, entertainment, and gossip. The conversations we had with one another began to expand it exponentially, such as celebrities conversing with their fans. 
But now politicians had begun to see the power in social media. They began creating profiles on another tech giant, Twitter. Now instead of sending a letter to your local politician, you could communicate with them directly. But this left the politicians vulnerable to the same psychological manipulation. First these corporations discovered new methods to get more people to vote. Now they had the power to manipulate the emotions of the very same politicians being voted for. Another utopian vision of cyberspace re-emerged after the financial crash of 2008. While the working class got no help from the government, the banks got a massive, multi-trillion dollar bailout. For example, Citibank received $4.6 trillion as part of the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008, otherwise known as the bailout. To put that into perspective, the Marshall Plan, the Louisiana Purchase, the Space Race, the bailouts for the savings and loans associations in the 1980s and 1990s, the Korean War, the New Deal, the invasion of Iraq, the Vietnam War, and NASA's entire budget over its lifetime, cost $3.92 trillion after inflation, less than the cost of the bailout for Citibank. This isn't counting the other banks that were bailed out, which when added up now controlled over 60% of US assets. And after all this spending with no help for US citizens, the rationale they gave was if the banks failed, it might destabilize the entire system. This is what spawned the Occupy protests. Public anger finally boiled over, and then the Occupy movement took over Wall Street, and then the Senate in Washington have pretty much corrupted our political system, and this is like the heart of it. I mean, this is a Senate building. These people have been blown up, and they've basically corrupted our democracy, and it's literally killing people. I'm an Iraqi war vet. I went to Iraq in 2009 to see what happens firsthand when we let corruption rule our government and our democracy, and we're coming here today basically just the way it's a rare. What drove the Occupy movement was the original dream of the internet that people like John Perry Barlow had outlined in the early 1990s. In his declaration of the independence of cyberspace, Barlow had described a new world free of politics and the old hierarchies of power, the space where people connected together as equals in a network and built a new society without leaders. Now the Occupy movement set out to build that kind of society in the real world. Even the meetings used the idea of the human microphone. People throughout the crowd repeated a speaker's words so everyone could hear them. But if someone wanted to challenge the speaker, the human amplifiers also had to repeat their words. So their voice had equal power. At least that was the idea. Each person was an autonomous individual who expressed what they believed, but together they became components in a network that organized itself through the feedback of information around the system. This was thought to be a model of how you could organize people without the exercise of power. However, it turned out to be the emergence of something far more chaotic. The next emergence of this phenomenon was the Arab Spring. The first revolution started on the internet. It quickly spread to Egypt on January 25, 2011, when thousands of Egyptians came out in groups across Cairo. Soon they started moving towards Tahoe Square, in what seemed like a spontaneous approach. And it was the internet which played a key role in organizing the group. One of the main activists was an Egyptian computer engineer. He worked for Google in Egypt, but had also set up the Facebook site that played the key role in organizing the first pipe that... نزلوا 
بعشرات الالاف يوم من 25 وارجوكم يا جماعه ما فيش ابطال الابطال هم الناس اللي في الشارع الابطال هو كل واحد فينا ما فيش واحد ما فيش النهارده واحد ركب الحصان هو اللي بيضرب السرج ويحرك الناس اوعى حد يضحك عليكم ويقول لكم كده دي ثوره شباب الانترنت دي ثوره شباب الانترنت اللي بقت بعد كده ثوره شباب مصر اللي بعد كده بقت ثوره كل مصر But Godin was also overwhelmed by the power of this new technology. Overwhelmed by the fact that a computer engineer with a keyboard could call out thousands of people, some of whom have died during the protests. Many liberals in the West saw this as proof of the revolutionary power of the internet. Again, it seemed to be able to organize a revolution without leaders. And this new phenomenon was powerful enough to topple a brutal dictator who had been backed by America and the West for 30 years. The internet radicals were not the only ones who saw their dreams being fulfilled in the Arab Spring. Many of the political leaders of the West also enthusiastically supported the revolutions because it seemed to fit with their simple idea of regime change. It might have failed in Iraq, but now people were rising up to rid themselves of the evil tyrants the politicians had both created and supported. So when an uprising began in Libya, Britain, France and America supported it. And suddenly Colonel Gaddafi stopped being the hero of the West with all the politicians and the public relations people and the academics who had all been curating his image suddenly disappeared. Gaddafi had once again become an evil dictator who had to be overthrown. Gaddafi retreated to the ruins of the house that the Americans had bombed 30 years before and addressed the world. In November 2011, a large convoy was spotted driving at high speed away from Colonel Gaddafi's home, with an American drone controlled from a shed outside Las Vegas following. The operator fired a missile at the lead car of the convoy. Gaddafi then fled looking for shelter from the oncoming rebel onslaught. He hid under the road in a drainage pipe before being dragged out at the mercy of angry rebels. Instead of becoming the democracy many had suspected would happen at Gaddafi's demise, Libya began to descend into chaos. It was around this time that other revolutions began to fail. The Occupy camps had become trapped in an endless meeting, and it became clear that there was a terrible confusion at the heart of the movement. The radicals had believed that they could create a new way of organizing people, while shaping a new society. But what they did not have was a picture of what that society would be like, or how it functioned. And the politicians, corporations, and special interests that were the focus of the movement had subverted their efforts with another campaign of perception management. However, their weakness was that the revolution was not about an idea. It was about how you manage things. And those who had started the revolution in Egypt came face to face with the same terrible fact. Social media had helped to bring people together in Tahrir Square, but once there, the internet gave no clue as to what kind of new society they could create in Egypt, and the movement stalled. A group that did have a path, however, was the Muslim Brotherhood, who rushed in to fill the vacuum. The Brotherhood took power in an election which led to the liberals and the left, bit by bit, turning back to the military, asking them to save the revolution from being captured by religious extremists. In the spring of 2013, the military took action. They arrested the president and killed hundreds of his supporters who protested, and an extraordinary spectacle that unfolded in Tahrir Square. 
thousands of liberals, who had begun the revolution two years ago, summoned by social media, now welcomed the military back by waving laser pointers at the helicopters flying overhead. After the failure of the revolutions, it was not just the radicals. No one in the West had any idea of how to change the law at home. The very politicians who had given so much of that power away to finance, Silicon Valley, and the ever-growing managerial bureaucracy, in effect, had become managers themselves. All their ventures had failed, and that simplistic vision of the world had been exposed as dangerous and destructive. What had subverted the West, however, was far more insidious than the blatant power grab made by the Muslim Brotherhood. Around 2011, when the Occupy movement began, media corporations, newspapers, and newly emerging blogs had started posting articles which contained words such as white privilege, systemic racism, or diversity training. And according to a statistical database known as the LexisNexis, these words had a sharp increase in their use around the same time. What was once a populist movement focused on the banks and politicians, Occupy Wall Street fell into a divisive cacophony of intersectional nonsense, which dissolved the already fragile unity of the protests. Some even speculate this was intentional. What was happening was the emergence of a new layer to the fake reality we currently reside in. It was a world that rose from the thrashing collapse of legacy news media. Advertising via Google became the largest platform to obtain money for online media companies. And with more and more people tuning out of legacy television, the internet was becoming the main source of viewership. This led to blogs, news organizations, and social media using those rational agents as market research. Key words were used to find what articles and stories gained the most hits. And what got the most hits was anger. For example, police shooting videos became popular because of the emotional reaction, which began manipulate the narrative surrounding police and minority communities. The more rage you induced within the system, the more money you got. It was simple, yet powerful. But the rational agents being used were still just a cartoon version of reality. And this cartoon version began to overtake the real world. People became convinced that what they saw on social media was real. The inexorable phenomenon of hyper-normalization was now more powerful than any government, corporation, or religion. It was then that a group of men had realized this could work to their advantage. What they had done was turn politics into a strange theater where nobody knew what was true or what was fake any longer. They were called political technologists. And they were the key figures behind President Putin. They had kept him in a power unchallenged for 50 years. Some of them have been dissidents back in the 1970s that had been powerfully influenced by the science fiction writings of the Stokowski brothers. After the end of communism, they rose up and took control of the media. And they used it to manipulate the electorate on a vast scale. For them, Reality was something that could be manipulated and shaped into anything you wanted it to be, taking their inspiration from the Hegelian school of thought. But then a technologist emerged who went much further, and his idea is what became central to Putin's grip on power. He was called Vladislav Surkov. Surkov originally came from the theater world, and those who have studied his career said that what he did was take avant-garde ideas from the theater and bring them into the heart of politics. Surkov's aim was not just to manipulate people, but to go deeper and play with and undermine their very perception, so they are never sure what is really happening. Surkov turned Russian politics into a bewildering, constantly changing piece of theater. 
He used Kremlin money to sponsor all kinds of groups from mass anti-fascist youth organizations to the very opposite, neo-Nazi skinheads, and even liberal human rights groups who then attacked the government. Serkov even backed whole political parties that were opposed to President Putin. But the key thing was that Serkov let it be known that this was what he was doing, which meant that no one was sure what was real or what was fake in modern Russia. A ceaseless shape-shifting narrative that is unstoppable because it is indefinable and constantly changing. As one journalist put it, it's a strategy of power that keeps any opposition constantly confused. Meanwhile, the real narrative was hidden away behind the stage. With an increasing dependence on social media for news, communication, and political discussions, the same phenomenon seemed to start happening in the West. It was becoming ever more clear that the current system operating civilization had deep flaws and structural weaknesses. Every month, there were new revelations. Of all the major banks' involvement in global corruption, of massive tax avoidance by all the major corporations, of the secret surveillance of everyone's emails by the National Security Agency. Even though all of this became public, no one was prosecuted except for a few people at the lowest levels. And behind it all, the massive inequality and institutional corruption kept on growing. The structure of power remained the same. Nothing ever changed because nothing could be allowed to destabilize the system. It was at this point the media began to adopt Sarkov's methods of political theater. The malleable, undefinable nature of this new paradigm began to take form in the real world with the presidential campaign of Donald Trump. Once loved by everyone in Hollywood, Trump had turned into a villain overnight. All because he was running on the Republican ticket. The radicals, the artists, the celebrities, and whole liberal establishment were the first to fall in line with the new narrative. The nuance had been ejected from their worldview, becoming a simple black and white version of reality. The lies, the unaccountability, the political subversion, and the slow degradation of American culture had grown out of control. The rational agents were shaping reality for them, being tweaked by corporations who had no anchor to the real world. Silicon Valley, once a focal point in technological innovation, had abandoned their ideals of progress and freedom for a more safe, corporate worldview influenced by algorithmic woke ideologies. And this was something Donald Trump seemed to understand better than most politicians. His influence and work in the media hypersphere gave him valuable insight into how the system worked. News reports were not fixed about what he said, who he attacked or how he attacked them, and the narrative surrounding him was constantly changing. He attacks his Republican rivals as being all part of a broken and corrupt system of politics where everyone could be booked. Using words that could have come from the Occupy movement. But at the same time, Trump was accused of using the same rhetoric as the extreme right in America. The media, both mainstream and online, was connecting with people's darkest fears, pushing them and bringing those fears out into the world. Many assertions about Trump were completely distorted or exaggerated. But Trump didn't care. He and his audience knew that much of what he said would be ignored, lied about, or misrepresented. But Trump had defeated the journalists. Because, while the journalists initially believed that their job was to expose lies and assert the truth, they had been blinded by the distorted lens that was the internet. Trump understood what was happening, 
He knew how to control the media's response and what they focused on, tweeting things that at times made no sense. He had been a master at media manipulation for decades. And now, instead of using it to shape his image, he was using it to expose their own hypocrisy. More liberals began to tune out and shifted away from the left. The center began to grow, with 13% of voters who had voted for Obama casting a vote for Trump. As both sides of the political spectrum shifted, the rational voters had began to move to the center, leaving the extremists behind who took control of their respective party. The fake world that had been under construction for the past 30 years was almost complete. Facts had become fluid and interchangeable. Science became political and nuance had disappeared entirely. The liberals were outraged by Trump, but they expressed their anger in cyberspace. So it had no effect because the algorithms made sure that they only spoke to people who already agreed with them. Instead, ironically, their waves of angry messages and tweets benefited the large corporations who ran the social media platforms and advertising firms. It meant that the radical fury that came like waves across the internet no longer have the power to change the world. Instead it was becoming a new conduit that was feeding the new systems of power and making them ever more powerful. The version of reality politics presented was no longer believable that the stories politicians and the mainstream media apparatus told the people about the world stopped making sense. By now, Syria was being torn apart by a horrific civil war. The Arab Spring had turned into a vicious battle to the death between Bashar Assad and his opponents. And at the heart of the conflict was the force that his father had first brought to the West, the suicide bomb. Back in the 1980s, Asha Assad's father had seen suicide bombing as a weapon he could use to force the Americans out of the Middle East. But over the next 30 years, it had shifted and mutated into something that had now ended up doing the very opposite, tearing the Arab world apart. Hassaf al-Assad's dream of a powerful and united Arab world was now destroyed. In Iraq, extremist Sunni groups had used suicide bombing as a way to start a sectarian war. Now groups like ISIS brought the same techniques into Syria not just to attack Assad's son, but his fellow Shiites. And like his father, Asha Assad retaliated with a vengeful fury, and the country fell apart. Faced by the war, Western politicians were bewildered. They insisted Asha Assad was evil. But then it turned out that his enemies were more evil and more horrific than him. So Britain, America, and France decided to bomb the terrorist threat. The effect of which was to help keep Assad in power. Then it became more confusing. Suddenly, the Russians intervened. President Putin sent hundreds of planes and combat troops to support Assad. But no one knew what their underlying aim was. They seem to be using a strategy that Sokov has developed in the Ukraine. He dubbed it non-linear warfare. It was a new kind of war, where you never knew what the enemy was really doing. The underlying aim, Sokov said, was not to win the war, but to use the conflict to create a constant state of destabilized perception. In March 2016, the Russians suddenly announced with great fanfare that they were leaving Syria. But in reality, they were never leaving. And the West still had no idea what they were doing or what their goals were. And within Syria, there was a new Islamist ideologist who was going to exploit the growing uncertainties in Europe and America. His name was Abu Musab al-Suri. 
Al-Suri had originally worked with bin Laden in Afghanistan, but he had turned against him. Al-Suri gave lectures that had a powerful effect on the Islamist movement. He argued that bin Laden had been wrong to attack the West head-on, because it created a massive military response that had almost destroyed Islamism. Instead, Al-Suri said, independent groups or individuals should stage random small-scale attacks on civilians in Europe and America. The aim was to spread fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and undermine the already failing authority of Western politicians. The effect of the attacks shocked Europe and America, and gave powerful force to the new politics of uncertainty and anxiety. This was now the worldview seen by media corporations, politicians, and activist groups. But it wasn't just taking over politics. It had taken control of the very thing that politics is derived from. Over the last decade, while the world was distracted by growing political confusion and dishonest reporting by mainstream media, corporations had also changed dramatically. Graduates from top universities were now in charge of HR departments and marketing firms, changing the culture within corporate America. But it was from these colleges that culture began to be dismantled and dissected. Programs in social sciences began to overtake the other sciences. And soon the phenomenon known as social justice broke through into the rest of the society, deconstructing culture, history, and language. The very same ideology that had silenced the Occupy movement, modern intersectionality, social justice, and woke ideologies began to reach the point of changing the very culture of America. But this was something more. It was the birth of a new religion.